Live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker. Kegro in the morning show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Tuesday, April 16th, 2019. Lots to catch up on today uh, from a lot of different angles. Boy, there's an awful lot happening. Uh, yesterday, while we were, uh, after we were finished with our production and had to put together our podcast for the day, the news broke that the Notre Dame, as that in terms of my French pronunciation, cathedral, was on fire. Uh, huge tragedy and loss there. I don't think uh, I've seen reports of any loss of life associated with it, so that's good news. Just a lot of, uh, well, a loss of standing for... Uh, we managed somehow to make this very French tragedy um, into a loss of uh, prestige and worldwide respect for the United States of America as we uh, had a president tweeting advice to French firefighters while they were working to save the cathedral. Uh, apparently, he tweeted them that uh, it was probably a good idea. You know, maybe they could put out the fire by bringing in giant, the flying water tanker planes, the kind that I plan to hire to uh, flood his grave with urine the day he is buried. But, uh, you know, you've seen them fighting forest fires in uh, the western United States. And I guess uh, he believed, I don't know, maybe he thought he was helping somehow. And uh, I don't know. I mean, it's not the, well, it's not what the president ought to be spending his time on, for one thing. But anyway, it was apparently a very stupid idea. And uh, that's because if you dump, oh, I don't know, hundreds of tons of water down on a structure like that that's uh, on fire, or really not even on fire, you will uh, collapse the structure essentially it'll have caved the roof in the fire was doing a pretty good job caving the roof in but then you would ruin so much more you'd pull the entire outer structure down but whatever trump wanted to send advice he's very into firefighting advice as you know uh he i'm surprised he didn't tweet them that uh, this was their own fault because finland rakes their cathedrals and everybody ought to know that but between the pictures of him playing in fire trucks and giving California wildfire advice and insisting that Finland didn't have wildfires because of rakes, uh, he was probably the last person, he's almost certainly the last person the French wanted to hear from in any situation. Uh, no truth to the rumor, however, that he called Emmanuel Macron to ask whether Rudy had made it out of Notre Dame safely. So at least we have that going for us. Um, there were, there was a, that was a, a big right wing talking point apparently yesterday was how dumb the French are for not taking American exceptionalism, I guess, uh, American exceptionalism at work. America's exceptional firefighting advice, uh, apparently made no difference to them. I just happened to see this morning <clears throat> Duke Street Journal tweeting, uh, or, or read, uh, reacting to someone else's tweet in which they report that Brian Kilmeade of Fox and Friends spent his day wondering, quote, if there's a story on what took so long for them to get to the fire, I wonder what the plan was, why it was not implemented, or was there no plan? I guess the fact that it burned down, or, you know, the interior was gutted anyway, um, led people to believe that there was no plan for fighting a fire in the cathedral. And apparently, I, I know nothing about it, but uh, Duke Street Journal here maintains that there has been a plan in place since the French Revolution, which makes some sense. You would think that that would probably spark some planning for saving historical, uh, well, everything, historical works of art, historical buildings, etc., in the face of such upheaval. Uh, but he goes on to say, following that plan is what saved the relics, the treasure, and the organ. A Fox and Friends producer could have learned this in 30 seconds if the show wasn't busy with its own agenda. I don't know how long it would have taken to learn that. It took me a while to learn it. I didn't see that tweet until this morning. But, um, yeah, it's not the fact that uh, everyone but Americans are running around with no plans for anything and have no idea how to do anything in their own country. But, of course, we had to turn it into a situation like that. And how embarrassing. Whatever. Okay, I think we'll get over it. They know that we're not all 
like that. I see also reports this morning that the most, I guess one of the most famed uh, features of the cathedral, their fantastic stained glass windows, the rose windows, apparently somehow survived the fire, although I don't know that they survived intact all the way. I'm not certain what the fact that they survived, the reporting that they survived exactly means. Um, I did, I saw what oh, it looked like photos of some substantial heavy flames pouring through the windows. Um, and maybe that it, it didn't burn out the, uh, the structure work of the windows, but I'm sure it damaged the, the glass inside. But uh, I, I guess I can't be positive about that. I don't know exactly what happened. And the reports are that they survived, I guess, largely survived, maybe would, would be, even that would be, I'm sure, a blessing for uh, the people who love and care about the cathedral. So I guess that's a, a bit of good news, that and the fact that I still have not seen any reports of any loss of life involved which is remarkable considering how large the fire was, but I guess they were able to evacuate everybody relatively quickly. <clears throat> so, you know, that's good news. Uh, the president didn't tweet or go on television to claim that he had the second tallest building or cathedral left in Paris, so nothing embarrassing like that happened. Other than that, um, I guess uh, there's still room for him to offer at some point today to rebuild the cathedral much more beautifully, of course, and for less money than anybody else could ever do it. And uh, I look forward to his spending the day on that. So, all right, uh, it's, it's quite the start of the day here, and uh, we have lots to catch up on, of course, on the Mueller report, uh, due out on Thursday, and lots of news about Barr himself, as I'm reminded by Justice's behind-the-scenes tweeting to me today about Barr having Russia ties, and of course they would be extremely long ties, because that's the fashion in the Trump administration. I do have a story tucked away on that, and we'll get to it, no doubt. Let me make sure that we are caught up with uh, the Twitter feed, so that we can watch what's happening today and keep an eye on things should news break Along the way, but we are ready and underway here. Daily Coast Radio is live now. We are reminded by Bill in Portland, Maine, a in a moment of heroic generosity, and that's the way I like my generosity. Kegro X, me, David Waldman, offers to house all the saved artifacts of Notre Dame in his tool shed for only one dollar a day. That's right, but uh, that's foregoing the huge grant money that I could be claiming, like Donald Trump, in the wake of. 9-11 out of the uh, goodness of my own heart. Speaking of 9-11 and Donald Trump's continued trolling of Ilan Omar over the subject, uh, leave it to Fox News to invite on for comment on this uh, topic Bernie Carrick, who, of course, uh, I guess is out of jail now for having been involved in a number of things, including a scheme to appropriate for his own illicit use in a nearby apartment that had been uh, set aside for 9-11 Ground Zero rescue and repair workers to rest in during the tragedy. Um, and he took it away and uh, thought he would use it for himself and then, of course, use it as a love nest to conduct one or two, possibly, of his own private illicit affairs there because he is such a genuine American hero. And that's terrific news. I'm just glad to hear that he had the uh, gumption to do that and to go on television. And of course, I think it was Hannity that hosted him uh, as if he had no recollection about this stuff. And I'm pretty sure, as dumb as Hannity is, he knew and remembered that, but did it anyway. So that's the kind of person he is. Let's see. Ah, what is this? Is this going to... Uh, yeah, well, why don't we take a look at this one? The New York Times. Have you heard of it? It's an important and uh, uh, loud-mouthed newspaper. Perhaps uh, you've encountered it in your travels. Let's see. Can I... I may have to uh, dock this one in pocket and then go and take a look at it. And uh, it is Trump's history of using 9-11 for political attacks. Isn't that interesting? By Sarah Maslin Neer, 
who, as if I recall correctly, is uh, is that a sister uh, or sister-in-law? I'm not certain of the relationship of, of our own David Near. He's pointed that out once or twice, but only once or twice, such that I can no longer remember exactly who we're talking about here. Maybe his sister. Uh, I guess the Maslin, w- I don't know whether that's her given middle name or whether she's a sister-in-law having married into the family. I don't remember. I'm sorry, David, but I'll get it straight next time. Uh, during which, uh, having promised to have gotten it straight, I will worry that I did not do that. Let's go to the story, though. That's probably the more important of the sides of this story. Donald J. Trump. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he has wielded the September 11th attack for many reasons. For a moment of somber reflection, I doubt that that was the case, even... Uh, though she was being generous here, uh, for a campaign rallying cry, of course, and for personal gain, naturally. With about two months left in the bruising 2016 presidential campaign, Donald J. Trump, why do you have to do the whole name again? The president who, oh, I see, I think uh, I think the first blurb there might have been a subtitle because I'm reading it in pocket format, not the original format. With about two months left in the campaign, Trump, the president-to-be, who took on Gold Star parents and a federal judge, don't forget that, and seemed emboldened by the skirmishes, don't forget that, agreed to pause his campaign on the anniversary of the September 11th attacks. The unexpected show of decorum turned out to be a rare departure for Trump, who has a history of using the September 11th attacks to make political points, either by trying to burnish his own reputation or by damaging others. The most recent example came last week when Mr. Trump circulated a video on Twitter to escalate his political attacks on Representative Ilhan Omar, the first-term Democrat of Minnesota, who is also the first Muslim woman to serve in Congress. Mr. Trump posted a 43-second video that interspersed the snippet of speech from Representative Ilhan Omar alongside footage of the September 11th attacks. His intent was to criticize what he apparently perceived as dismissive comments about the attack made by the congresswoman. There were, of course, no such dismissals, but okay. The tweet was shared widely by Mr. Trump's supporters, who believe the words that Ms. Omar used to describe the attacks, some people did something, minimized the tragedy, although that actually minimizes the, uh, the, the quotation itself, but okay. The video in which Ms. Omar's words are smash cut, nice, with pictures of the World Trade Center on fire, drew condemnation from her supporters, They accused the president of using a small portion of a speech on civil rights to the Council on American Islamic Relations, an anti-discrimination group, to foment xenophobia and an anti-Muslim sentiment, which would really be a tragedy in the face of having spoken to a group who is about anti-discrimination. But we're no strangers to uh, his antics. Representative Tim Ryan, an Ohio Democrat, was among Several presidential hopefuls who criticized Mr. Trump's tweet. That's an interesting choice. He accused the president of being irresponsible for invoking 9-11 for political gain. It's un-American to its core because his whole goal is to divide us, Mr. Ryan wrote on Twitter. We deserve better than this from the most powerful office in the world. Yeah, I know. On the presidential campaign trail, Mr. Trump asserted that he had a crow's nest view of the attacks on the World Trade Center saying that he had a window in his apartment that, quote, was specifically aimed at the World Trade Center. I doubt it. And from that window, Mr. Trump said he watched those people jump. I watched the second plane hit. At the time, Mr. Trump lived at Trump Tower in Midtown Manhattan, about four miles from the Trade Center. Rick Riley, the sports journalist whose book Commander in Cheat, How Golf Explains Trump. Remember that? We read it about it a little bit few days ago, he said that the president claimed to have used a telescope. Interesting. So, A, a window, speci- I don't know what specifically aimed at the World Trade Center is supposed to mean, but it makes it sound as though he had the building constructed such that one of his windows would face somehow directly at, I mean, they're pretty big windows. They, and he's taken a sweeping vista. I don't think there's anything specifically aimed at anything. But anyway, oh, I saw people, you know, jumping out. It's four miles. That's a long way to be able to see that. And of course, I guess if you've got a telescope, uh, it's possible. But let's see what uh, Rick Riley has to say here. I once looked through his telescope in Trump Tower apartments that looked downtown. 
Mr. Riley wrote on Twitter. He said, I saw the towers come down through that telescope. I lifted my head up. Oh, my God, I gasped. Right? She goes, you know, because it's a profound thing. Oh, my God, you saw the towers come down through that telescope? And Trump's response is, solid gold. That is to say, the telescope he wanted everyone to know is made of solid gold. I doubt that it's true. I doubt that anybody would make a telescope out of solid gold. I think it would distort. I think it would warp and distort too easily, and you wouldn't be able to see a damn thing out of it after about 15 minutes. But uh, I'm sure it's gold plated. That seems pretty Trumpish. But uh, how amazing is that? Wow. You, oh my God. That's amazing. I know because it's gold. Eh, I was thinking a little bit more about the event itself. Also, um, I don't think any of you really need a moment to pause to do this, but I'm going to give everybody a chance just to catch up. Think about what you think Donald Trump was really doing with that telescope. He didn't make the telescope and say, well, if the Twin Towers are ever smashed into by terrorists who have hijacked aircraft and come tumbling down, I'll have a great view of it. He put a telescope in his apartment because, guess. Right, I think you have a good idea. Anyway, next up is the story of the 40 Wall Street building, which we all remember and we were reminded of earlier. The landmark 72-story tower, 40 Wall Street, is commonly known as the Trump Building, Less so these days, I think. After the terrorist attacks, Mr. Trump applied for and received $150,000 from a New York state recovery fund for small businesses, because that's what Trump is. Though Mr. Trump owns a business empire, he was eligible because the Trump-owned entity controlling 40 Wall Street had fewer than 500 employees, according to reports. In other words, one of his shell companies, a holding company that there are probably no employees of, that uh, held the deed to 40 Wall Street for the Trump organization qualifies technically because we had a bad did a bad job defining what a small business is. Mr. Trump had said the money was an automatic reimbursement for housing volunteers and emergency personnel who responded to the devastation like they were supposed to be doing in that apartment that Bernie Carrick appropriated for his own use, but didn't. But the application filed with the Empire State Development Corporation, which operated the fund, was for cleanup, repair, and loss of rental income, according to a New York Daily News investigation. The day of the attacks, Mr. Trump said his building, about seven blocks from where the trade center stood, was unscathed. Now he said more about the building, of course, and that's something most people are familiar with, and that comes up next in the roundup of stories here about 40 Wall Street, but just pause to take note. He went on television to say his building survived intact, unscathed, but accepted $150,000 from New York State on the grounds that it was meant to pay for damage and cleanup and repair to the building that had previously been reported to be unscathed. Hmm. Representative Gerald Nadler, maybe you've heard of him, now chair of the House Judiciary Committee, uh, went so far on Sunday as to say Mr. Trump stole the funds. I'm in agreement. Uh, Go, Jerry. You say it that way. The 40 Wall Street episode Mr. Nadler said on CNN shortly after the video of Ms. Omar was shared undermined the president's condemnation of her. He has no moral authority to be talk- at all to be talking about 9-11, or rather, he has no authority to be talking about 9-11 at all. Mr. Nadler said the building also came up during a television interview with Mr. Trump on September 11th, 2001. 40 Wall Street actually was the second tallest building in downtown Manhattan. And it was actually, before the World Trade Center, was the tallest. And then when they built the World Trade Center, it became known as the second tallest. And now it's the tallest. It didn't become known as the second tallest. No one knew that, by the way. No one ever discussed it. Um... Not a matter of discussion whatsoever anywhere in the New York metropolitan area. I'm positive of it. I never heard it myself, certainly. Not that I'm the arbiter of such things. But uh, who talks about what's the second tallest building? Nobody. And uh, that's that. If, if it was ever discussed at all, it was used uh, as the second tallest building in Manhattan, maybe. I guess if that was true of the Empire State Building, people might have said that. Anyway, there's more. 
He lied a whole lot more, and in a whole lot more situations. Perhaps Mr. Trump's most incendiary use of the terrorist attacks as a political point was made at a campaign rally in Birmingham, Alabama in 2015. Mr. Trump, then a presidential candidate, told supporters that on the day of the attack in Jersey City, just across the Hudson River from Manhattan, thousands and thousands of people were cheering as that building was coming down. Thousands of people were cheering. Mr. Trump said the celebrants were Muslim. Mr. Trump continued to use the talking point throughout his campaign, even as reports of such celebrations were repeatedly debunked. Pointing to reporting from the Washington Post in 2001 that said the police had looked into the allegations of celebrations, Mr. Trump expressed vindication and mocked the physical disability of a Post reporter whom he said corroborated his belief. The reporter, Serge Kovaleski, now works for the Times, by the way, so there you go. They had to make a disclaimer of that, I guess. Next up, in 2017, Mr. Trump signed into law an expansion of a 2001 act that created a Medal of Valor for 9-11 first responders, widening the scope of who was eligible for the award. But the next year, the president's proposed 2019 budget included restructuring the National Institutes of Health, a move that would have dried up some funding for health-related claims by people affected by the attacks. After vociferous outcry from victims and lawmakers, a cause also picked up by the comic and talk show host John Stewart, the plan was scrapped. In February, the September 11th Victim Compensation Fund announced it was running out of money and would have to slash payouts for new claimants by up to 70% leading to calls for its renewal. The fund, which was almost quashed in 2011 by Republicans, is set to terminate in 2020. Hmm. If that's a significant date, let me know. In the weeks after the attacks, Mr. Trump appeared on the Howard Stern Show and pledged $10,000 in charitable donations to the Twin Towers Fund. During the 2016 presidential campaign, Mr. Trump made references to his September 11th donations and to other efforts to help out at Ground Zero. But in October of 2016, Scott M. Stringer, the New York City comptroller, found no donation made by Mr. Trump to that charity in the 12-month period following the on-air pledge. What a surprise. As president, Mr. Trump has been in office for two anniversaries of the event. In 2017, he marked the occasion at the Pentagon in a somber memorial, Uh, Quoting him here, on that day, not only did the world change, but we all changed. Mr. Trump said at the time, our differences never looked so small. Our common bonds never felt so strong. He couldn't have possibly written that. Last year, Mr. Trump visited the Flight 93 National Memorial in Pennsylvania, the site where passengers brought down a plane hijacked by terrorists on September 11th, saying, this field is now a monument to American defiance. America will never, ever submit to tyranny, except if it's mine. That same year, he used the occasion to praise Rudy Giuliani, his lawyer, who was mayor of New York City at the time of the attack. In 2013, before he was president, Mr. Trump struck a very different tone on Twitter. Oh, my goodness, it's cutting me off here. I've never had that happen before uh, in the use of the pocket version of the New York Times. So um, I wonder uh, what's going on here. uh, In case you're wondering why it is that I'm even using that version of a New York Times article, it's uh, two reasons. One, uh, they have hilariously not figured out that uh, if you send articles that are behind their paywall to pocket, you are able to read them, at least in limited sense, uh, regardless. And two... um, my, I guess my initial subscription to the New York Times has expired, and although it wouldn't cost very much to renew it, I am undecided as to whether or not I should continue to do that, given all the criticism we've had on the show and elsewhere around uh, the country of the New York Times and what they're doing and how they handle news. Do I give them $2 a week? Do I give up on them entirely. I mean, they, there's, it's like there's too much that they do. They still do so much so well, but it's offset by the number of infuriating uh, mistakes or 
purposeful mistakes, possibly, that they make in their political coverage every day. All right, well, I think you've gotten the flavor of what it is that Donald Trump uses 9-11 for in his personal and political careers, such as they are. Uh, so uh, we'll move on from there because we have to. It's interesting that it ran out on me like that. It usually displays the entire text, but I guess they broke the text up in some funny way electronically on the pay site. And uh, well, good for you, finally figuring out what's going on here and uh, rightfully depriving me of the second half of your story or however much was left. Okay, many other sources of uh, interesting news and entertainment out there for discussion. I mentioned to you that uh, Barr himself has some interesting ties, as I said, Russia ties. Uh, That story out there, in a number of outlets, including Newsweek. Of course, we are heading into our first break, and we'll have to deal with that first, but I'll give you a teaser of the headline in Newsweek, by a story by Christina Maza. Should William Barr recuse himself from the Mueller report? It's a little late for that one, but legal experts say Attorney General's ties to Russia are troubling, and I am unaware of exactly what the ties are. I look forward to finding out after the next break. Uh, Recusing himself from the report seems a little late in coming, of course. Uh, And Naturally, uh, well, it's not really even the Mueller report. I guess it's dealing with the Mueller report he'd have to recuse himself from. The report we'll see on Tuesday, of course, just another version of the Barr report. Even referring to it as a Mueller report is probably a mistake in framing what's coming up. You know that because we've discussed it thoroughly, but we'll discuss it some more after this. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. And uh, let's continue. Let's dive in here. Uh, I just had to take a pause during the break to swap out the extraordinarily squeaky chair that one of my sons is using at his own computer station. It is spring break, and it's already Tuesday, and you haven't heard me complain yet about the noise in the background, so pretty good record so far. And uh, I guess it's partially due to the fact that at least my older son is uh, getting to the age where he'll sleep through the show entirely. Uh, Not quite yet the case for my younger tween, but perhaps by the end of the week. Let's see. I I can see him getting, uh, uh, let's say, uh, less and less energetic as the week goes on. All right. Well, anyway, let's move on here. Should William Barr recuse himself from the Mueller report? Legal experts say Attorney General's ties to Russia are troubling, and any that he might have would at this stage be troubling, because that's what the report is about. Here they go again, is how it starts, and that's not promising. Attorney General William Barr is already under fire for his March letter to Congress, which reported the results of special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation in a way many feel was mostly beneficial to President Donald Trump. It's a gentle way of putting it. Now Democrats are taking aim at Barr's recent congressional testimony in which he slipped his opinion, slipped in his opinion, that federal law enforcement officials may have, quote, spied on his boss's successful presidential run. But if that wasn't enough, some experts argue that Barr's previous work in the private sector could conflict with his continuing supervision of the investigation into Russian tampering in the 2016 election campaign. Why? Well, let's find out. A few of Barr's previous employers are connected to key subjects in the probe. 
And some argue that even if Barr didn't break any rules, his financial ties to to companies linked to aspects of the Russia investigation raise questions about whether he should, like his predecessor Jeff Sessions, recuse himself. Although it was for clearly different reasons. But okay. The legal standard is really clear about these issues. It's not about actual conflict. It's about the appearance of conflict, about the appearance of bias. Jed Sugarman, a professor at Fordham University's School of Law and an expert on judicial and government ethics, tells Newsweek, the problem is that we have so many flagrant conflicts that are so obvious, we get distracted from what the legal standard is. Hmm. This much is known. On Barr's public financial disclosure report, he admits to working for a law firm that represented Russia's Alpha Bank, remember them, and for a company whose co-founders allegedly have long-standing business ties to Russia. What's more, he received dividends from Vector Group, a holding company with deep financial ties to Russia. In what sense? I don't know. Let's see if we can find out. These facts didn't get much attention during Barr's confirmation hearing as Congress was hyper-focused on an unsolicited memo Barr wrote prior to his nomination, which criticized the special counsel's investigation and whether he would release an unredacted Mueller report to Congress. How did that go, by the way? Much of the information is public, but it has so far been unreported in relation to Barr. Still, Barr's potential conflicts could face further scrutiny as Democrats in Congress fight to have the Mueller report released to the public. By the time you read this, which is now, the report may indeed be in the hands of Congress. It is not. But legal battles are expected over how much of the document will be redacted to protect grand jury material and other information. And no matter what appears in Barr's color-coded version of the report, that's the one we're expecting on Thursday, his motives will continue to be questioned. By the way, redaction with black uh, pen is color coding. I mean, technically speaking, right? Black's a color. Well, it's really the absence of color. Don't give me that. But, um, you know, the page is a different color. And so it's color coded. There's just one color in our code, black. Does that count? Would you get away with that one? All, uh, let's see, all of this raises the need for further inquiry from an independent review, not a Department of Justice investigation, Michael Frisch, ethics counsel for Georgetown University's law school and an expert in professional ethics, tells Newsweek. Scott Amy, general counsel at, uh, I'm guessing at the pronunciation of A-M-E-Y, he's general counsel at the Project for Government Oversight and says that Barr is probably playing with the rules. But that doesn't mean he shouldn't recuse himself. Playing within the rules, I see. But doesn't mean he shouldn't recuse himself. Uh, he's probably playing with the rules as well. Uh, that's uh, easy to see why that was my first reading of it. He's not doing anything illegal, as far as we know. But it is good practice, or rather he's questioning, is it good practice given that he might have been involved with these entities in private practice? Probably not, Amy added. The... Department of Justice did not respond to multiple requests for comment. Nonetheless, here's a pocket guide to Barr's Russian connections. Ready? Fill your pockets with this. There's the Vector Group, of course, about which we know this. On his financial disclosure report, Barr notes that he earned anywhere from $5,001 to $15,000 in dividends from the Vector Group. The company's president, Howard Lorber, brought Trump to Moscow in the 1990s to seek investment projects there. The trip is widely seen as the first of many attempts to establish a Trump Tower in Moscow. The problem, says Sugarman, is the appearance of bias, although it's not a whole lot of appearance, quite honestly. He added that Donald Trump Jr. allegedly called Lorber as he was setting up the Trump Tower meeting with a Russian lawyer. Remember Veselnetskaya? That one. Lorber has extensive ties to Russia and was allegedly assisting with Trump Tower Moscow plans. On top of Barr's other choices, which reflect partisan bias, it is bad judgment to have any financial ties to a person so directly entangled with Trump, Don Jr., and the core of events and questions of the Russia investigation. Next up is the situation with Alpha Bank. Barr's former law firm, Kirkland & Ellis, where he was counsel from March 2017 until he was confirmed as attorney general in February of 2019, 
represented Russia's Alpha Bank. Barr earned more than a million dollars at Kirkland. Barr also supervises at Justice and other Kirkland and Ellis alumnus with Alpha Ties. Early last year, Trump nominated Kirkland and Ellis partner Brian Benkowski to the Justice Department's criminal division. In his role with the law firm, Benkowski had represented Alpha Bank and supervised an investigation into suspicious online communications between the bank and servers belonging to the Trump Organization. That's probably more of a conflict of interest than Barr has here, but they did it anyway. Investigators found no evidence that the Trump Organization had communicated with Alpha. Still, the bank is partially owned by Russian oligarch German Khan, whose son-in-law, the London-based lawyer Alexander van der Zwan, was indicted by special counsel Robert Mueller for lying to investigators about a report his firm had written for Trump's former campaign manager, Paul Manafort. Wow, they're everywhere. Benkowski was confirmed last July as assistant attorney general for the Justice Department's criminal division. In terms of a lawyer's professional codes, it's definitely legally significant if Barr is in counsel position, Frisch tells Newsweek. If he is counsel to the company and he isn't personally working on a matter, but the company is, the company's conflicts are imputed to him. And that's extraordinarily tough as a standard goes. And uh, realistically speaking, it's just not the case that everybody who works or even was a partner at Kirkland and Ellis would necessarily have had any contact at all with the Alpha Bank client, but it's entirely possible. And so... You want to, uh, you know, in an abundance of caution, which you're not going to find in this administration, you might want to wall yourself off from this. There's another situation coming up next here. Uh, questions have also been raised about whether OCZIF Capital Management, that's O-C-H hyphen Z-I-F-F, OCZIF, maybe, ZIF Capital Management, a hedge fund where Barr was a board director from 2016 to 2018, may also be too closely connected to the Russia investigation. The billionaire Ziff brothers, Dirk, Robert, and Daniel, are they all billionaires? Wow. i got to get in on one of these families. Provided seed money to hedge fund manager Daniel Oak, Oak, I would guess maybe, rather than Oak, uh, to start the firm in 1992. So let's see. Three billionaire brothers gave seed money to a hedge fund manager to start this uh, Auk Ziff Capital Management in 1992. They retained a small stake in the company after it went public in 2007. The brothers are also a subject of interest to the Russian government because of their work with billionaire William Browder, a financier who ran afoul of the Kremlin <clears throat> and whose uh, uh, attorney, was the Magnitsky, for whom the Magnitsky Act was named. You'll remember all of that from our previous discussions. Natalia Veselnitskaya, the Russian lawyer who met with Donald Trump Jr., Trump's son-in-law and advisor, Jared Kushner, and Manafort in the now infamous June 2016 Trump Tower meeting, mentioned the Ziff brothers during her meeting as part of the promised dirt on Hillary Clinton. Browder tells Newsweek, that Veselnitskaya had mentioned the Ziff brothers only because of their association with him. It was purely directed at me, and they had the misfortune of being associated with me, Browder said. Well, it's a par for the course with these billionaires. They always think everything's about them. Some experts argue that Barr's work for Oak Ziff creates the appearance of a conflict of interest because the Russian government's interest in the brothers was a component of the investigation. The fact that Veselnitskaya is in a meeting, that's the Trump Tower meeting, talking about Browder and Browder's associates is a question about this meeting and the focus on Browder and the Ziff brothers. That is ground zero of the collusion question, Sugarman said. Next up, Deutsche Bank. And it actually says that right here in the article, quoting from a, Yup, them again. Barr has significant assets between $100,000 and $250,000 with Deutsche Bank, which was the only bank that would lend to Trump when all other banks viewed him as too hot to handle. The bank has also been implicated in Russian money laundering scandals. Two congressional committees are now looking into Trump's business ties to Deutsche Bank. It is unclear if Barr has divested from Vector Group or pulled his assets out of Deutsche Bank since he became attorney general. The verdict... 
So all of, are all of these cases grounds for Barr's recusal? Has he crossed a red line? Well, it would depend on his personal involvement. Did he profit from this in any way? Larry Noble, a democracy and ethics expert and former counsel for the Federal Election Commission, tells Newsweek, it's a little bit concerning, generally, with his administ this administration because everybody seems to have some connection somehow to people involved with Russian investment or Russia at some point. Don't, as they say, touch that dial. But I would say, go ahead, touch that dial. Pretty much any channel will have this news eventually. But okay, I get where you're going, where you're going with that uh, statement. Um, not the strongest ties in the world. And uh, of course, I guess we should probably point out it was very likely the aim of any conscious effort on the part of the Russians to do anything, uh, big or small, in the United States. Probably an aim to involve as many prominent figures and institutions as possible in their dealings, um, not only to obfuscate what might actually be going on with uh, partners with whom they were working more closely, um, but also to try and extract some kind of leverage out of the most number of people who might otherwise be interested in exposing the connections of others. Well, you better not uh, uh, pursue this too rigorously or we'll expose you for, as a hypocrite for having similar connections. I think that's probably standard operating procedure for them. But And, and too bad, and it makes things complicated. But... Uh, uh, even if they were uh, very definite and well-established, close personal ties with Russian operators, um, the truth is it wouldn't get in Barr's way now that he's in. It might have caused a problem for him during a confirmation hearings, but somehow they managed to get everybody to ignore this stuff during the confirmation hearings. Not that it mattered anyway. They were going to bulldoze him through regardless because they had the numbers in the Senate. And we were going to be stuck with him anyway, knowing that he has no care whatsoever about any of these charges. It's just interesting background knowledge for those of us who want something else to point to about how terrible he is. Either right now or after his next redacted and who knows how manipulated version of the Mueller report is delivered on Thursday, if that's in fact ends up being the case. All right. Let's see. I have also, speaking of Barr, and because we have a little bit more time before our next break, two stories, uh, well, two looks at the same story, I think, uh, offering up reasons to uh, worry very deeply about what it is Barr is likely to produce. We'll begin with the one closer to home from Mark Sumner right here at Daily Coast who notes in a story yesterday uh, the title, This isn't the first time William Barr tried to fool Congress and the nation with a summary. That should give you, and that probably wraps it up. That's all you need to know. You can probably guess the rest. We have his story, and we also have a piece from JustSecurity.org, Ryan Goodman, writing on this in uh, what appears to be somewhat more detail. But you know how we like to sum these things up uh, quickly for your morning reading at Daily Coast. But Mark Sumner, uh, I think one of our uh, one of our best at that. Let's take a look. In 1979, the United States signed a treaty that would gradually turn over control of the Panama Canal Zone. You remember this stuff to the nation in whose territory it was found. That would be Panama. But. By 1989, the U.S. government was profoundly unhappy with the de facto Panamanian military dictator Manuel Noriega. Remember? So, then head of the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel, we mention them all the time, right? The OLC. Well, that was William Barr. And William Barr was given an assignment. Come up with a legal justification for the United States to enter a sovereign country, Panama, Depose its leader. It says uh, dispose its leader. Um, but uh, I suppose that actually works grammatically. Kidnap him and bring him to America to stand trial. All right. Well, those are the instructions. So Barr did just that. 
As Political Wire reports, Barr sent Congress a letter on Friday the 13th, 1989, the same day as, uh, well, what day? Friday the 13th of what month? Well, let's see. Uh, this Political Wire's reports. I mean, Friday the 13th, I don't know if there was just one, but it was October 1989, just in case you were wondering, uh, as I was. Uh, so, that was, oh, this would have pointed things up for us. It was on Friday the 13th, 1989, the same day as a massive stock market crash. That would have reminded us it was October. That concluded that the FBI could forcibly ad- abduct people in their countries without the consent of the foreign state. Um, hmm. I would like to know what his reasoning was, but it probably had something to do with the fact that the guy they were kidnapping is the one who would give consent ordinarily, and they weren't going to get that. Barr made it seem that his position was the result of a study by the Justice Department and represented the department's best legal opinion. But there was a problem. Barr would only provide Congress with a summary of that opinion. And here, a quote, Members of Congress asked to see the full legal opinion. Barr refused, but said he would provide an account that, quote, summarizes the principal conclusions. Unquote. And this, I guess, grabbed from the Political Wire report on this topic. Um, hmm. So in the end, Congress actually acted. A subpoena was issued and the DOJ eventually provided Congress with complete information. What did they discover? That Barr had significantly misled Congress and that his summary actually failed to dis- fully disclose the study's principal conclusions much less its full opinion on the legality of the proposed action. But by then, actions had already been taken that could not be reversed, i.e. we had, of course, invaded Panama and grabbed Manuel Noriega and taken him back to the United States to stand trial, just what they wanted him to do. Now, the political wire story is based on the just security story. So for purposes of getting a thorough background on this, we jump over now to Ryan Goodman's entry from Monday. Barr's playbook, he misled Congress when omitting parts of Justice Department memo in 1989. So we begin again, this time with a more in-depth look. On Friday the 13th, October 1989, By happenstance, the same day as the Black Friday market crash, news leaked of a legal memo authored by William Barr. He was then serving as head of the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel, or OLC. And just as a brief reminder for everybody, the OLC memos are essentially deemed to carry something near the weight of law in legal circles. Um, They are usually called upon to address questions that fall outside the plain language of law or, for that matter, the Constitution. Um, uh, but uh, they are, uh, they're not authoritative in the same sense as law. Um, and that's not really what I meant to say. It's not that their uh, opinions are given the weight of, of statutory law, per se, but they are the next best thing to an opinion from a competent court of, you know, or a court of competent jurisdiction, I guess. Uh, federal courts, um, of course, only accept questions that have live controversies attached to them. They don't issue advisory opinions. Would it be legal if we did this? Would it be legal if we did that? They will only uh, address the question directly with uh, uh, the the question of, we have done this, and is it legal or is it not? Or we have uh, refrained from doing this. Uh, Was that choice legal or not? Whereas the question of, well, what if we did things this way or that way? Or what's the most, you know, legally sound way of approaching this problem? That's, uh, that has become the job of the, the Office of Legal Counsel. And they very frequently, their memos carry a lot of weight with the White House and White Houses uh, in the past, where they've regarded um, the question of what might the law say about this as a serious one, unlike this current administration, 
the uh, the reputation is such that um, it, well, their reputation is of uh, employing some of the sharpest legal minds available to the administration, and very frequently people who have worked there have come from out of clerkships with Supreme Court justices and have some sense personally of how those justices would approach the questions. That's why they're considered to be uh, good sources of answers for the question of would this be held to be legal or constitutional, and they give it their you know, their best shot at trying to determine where they think courts would land or should land on certain questions that haven't yet come up. And White Houses, previous White Houses, have felt themselves to be on solid legal ground in leaning on, depending on OLC opinions and OLC memos um, as a result of that close relationship working relationship with the members of the Supreme Court and their reputation for doing, generally speaking, honest work. There's, of course, room for corruption of all that. If uh, you convince the world that OLC opinions are uh, very nearly have, uh, I guess I should say, the the weight of judicial uh, dictates, I guess, then uh, if you're willing, if everybody will buy into that and you're willing to stretch the truth and stand by those memos no matter what, or at least nearly no matter what, you can get away with an awful lot. If you are um, able to get somebody to uh, in the OLC to issue the opinion you want, despite the fact that there maybe, let's say, the rest of the OLC line attorneys don't agree but you have a political appointee, say, in the form of, oh, I don't know, a John Yu, for instance, who's willing to put the OLC imprimatur on memos justifying the torture of non-state uh, actors whom you've captured uh, as terrorists and are holding indefinitely. That's been, it's been an issue, and it's not just the... George W. Bush administration and John Yu, not just the Trump administration and their people, but also, I mean, as far back as uh, the George H. W. Bush administration and Bill Barr. I mean, there's always room for questioning just exactly what is motivating these people when they are, their job involves very often plucking pseudo legal precedent from out of thin air. And the temptation is overwhelming to over leverage the deference given to OLC and uh, it's hard to resist and most most administrations don't but some overstep the bounds by larger lengths than others let's say okay so back to the story here um, members of Congress of course ask to see the full legal opinion about uh, grabbing Noriega. Oh, I don't think we even got that far in this thing. Um, he was then, uh, we, we just discussed the fact that Bill Barr was then the head of the OLC. It's highly uncommon for any OLC memo to make headlines. This one did because it was issued in unusual secrecy and concluded that the FBI could forcibly abduct people in other countries without the consent of the foreign state. The headline also noted the implication of the legal opinion at the moment at that moment in time, it appeared to pave the way for abducting Panama's leader, General Manuel Noriega. Members of Congress asked to see the full legal opinion. Barr refused, but said he would provide an account that, quote, summarized the principal conclusions, unquote. And that's uh, important because they ask next. Sound familiar? Summarize the principal conclusions. In March... 2019, when Attorney General Barr was handed Robert Mueller's final report, he wrote that he would, quote, summarize the principal conclusions of the special counsel's report for the public. Exactly the same words, in case you hadn't noticed. When Barr withheld the full OLC opinion in 1989 and said to trust his summary of the principal conclusions, Yale Law School professor Harold Coe, K-O-H, and uh, did he eventually become a federal judge? I'm not certain. Uh, anyway, he wrote that Barr's position was, quote, particularly egregious. Congress also had no appetite for Barr's stance and eventually issued a subpoena 
to successfully wrench the full OLC opinion out of the department. What's different from that struggle and the current struggle over the Mueller report is that we now, uh, or the, we know how the one in 1989 eventually turned out. When the OLC opinion was finally made public, long after Barr left office, it was clear that Barr's summary had failed to fully disclose the opinion's principal conclusions. It is better to think of Barr's summary as a redacted version of the full OLC opinion. That's because the summary took the form of 13 pages of written testimony. The document was replete with quotations from court cases, legal citations, and the language of the OLC opinion itself. Despite its highly detailed analysis, though, this 13-page version omitted some of the most consequential and incendiary conclusions from the actual opinion. And there was evidently no justifiable reason for having withheld those parts from Congress or the public. When first asked by reporters about the OLC opinion that Friday, Barr said he could not discuss any of its contents. I just don't discuss the work of the Office of Legal Counsel, he said. The office, an ellipsis, provides legal advice throughout the administration and does it on a confidential basis, but not always that confidential. The idea is that Barr and the administration would not even discuss the content of the opinion, or rather the idea that that would happen, could not withstand public pressure. Barr's stance was especially untenable because his OLC opinion reversed a prior OLC opinion, which is an unusual event, and the Justice Department had released that prior opinion in full to the public just four years earlier. President George H.W. Bush was asked about the Barr legal opinion at a news conference on the day the story broke. The FBI can go into Panama now, a reporter asked in connection with the legal opinion. Bush responded that he was embarrassed not to know about that OLC opinion. Welcome back now to the Kegel in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Just a short break during which I uh, double-checked. Now, Harold Coe never did become a federal judge, although I don't know whether he was ever nominated and or, or discussed and blocked. Maybe he was, uh, perhaps his name might have come up at some point um, on like lists, perhaps, you know, short lists for uh, federal judgeships or even Supreme Court consideration. I don't know why his name is so familiar to me, but he's got a illustrious career and it might just be because of that. He's served in administrations past. Um, he was legal advisor to the Department of State during the Barack Obama administration. He's been deal, uh, dean of the Yale Law School. That certainly would have brought an awful lot of notoriety with it. Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor during the Clinton administration. Um, and, uh, you know, who knows how many other discussions he may have come up uh in before and uh yeah you know I, I don't know what it is that makes me think that he had been on someone's short list for important placement on the federal bench but uh, it probably happened at some point and uh, those who remember say oh yeah well of course i can't believe you uh don't remember this so uh, let's see hmm uh, and it may be just the fact that he was in other administration jobs that required um, the advice and consent of the Senate. And so I recall that there were hearings and maybe that's confusing me. But anyway, back to uh, the bar playbook as covered by Ryan Goodman here in Just Security. Recall that uh, we left off by noting that President George H.W. Bush was in the dark about this OLC opinion. A reporter asked him uh, in connection with his opinion, uh, the FBI can go into Panama and he said he was embarrassed not to know about the OLC opinion. I'll have to get back to you with the answer, the president said. That's from remarkable secrecy. When they say it was uh, unprecedented secrecy, they kept it from the president of the United States, apparently. So that's pretty tightly held information. Within hours, Secretary of State James Baker tried to make some reassuring public comments about the content of the OLC opinion, this is a very narrow legal opinion based on consideration only of domestic United States law, Baker said. It did not take into account international law. 
nor did it weigh the president's constitutional responsibility to carry out the foreign policy of the United States. It's not known whether Baker had first cleared his statement with the Justice Department, as is often the case for such matters, but his description of the OLC opinion would turn out to be not just misleading, but false. The chair of the House Judiciary Committee's Subcommittee on Civil and Constitutional Rights, Representative Don Edwards, then wrote to the Attorney General requesting the opinion, but he was rebuffed. An Assistant Attorney General wrote back, We are unable to provide you with a copy of the 1989 opinion because it is the established view of the Department of Justice that current legal advice by the Office of Legal Counsel is confidential, she stated, but there was no categorical prohibition, as Barr himself would later admit in testifying before Congress. In other words, the letter uh, you know, made up this standard. The Assistant Attorney General's letter itself included one glaring counterexample. I am enclosing a copy of the 1980 opinion, she wrote, and she noted that the department had released the 1980 opinion to the public in 1985. So why not release the 1989 opinion? Was there something to hide? What's next? Barr provides a redacted opinion to Congress. On the morning of November 8, 1989, Barr came to Congress to testify before Representative Edwards' committee, subcommittee. Some of the events that unfolded also bear a remarkable resemblance to Barr's handling of the Mueller report to date. First, Barr started out by saying that the history of internal Justice Department rules was a, a basis for not handing over the full opinion to Congress. Chairman... Since its inception, the Office of Legal Counsel's opinions have been treated as confidential, Barr said. That statement was misleading or false, and Chairman Edwards knew it, because, of course, he had been in Congress for a little while and had seen what happened when they asked OLC for opinions. Edwards quickly pointed out that the department had released a compendium of opinions for the general public, including the 1981 that Barr's secret opinion reversed. Up until 1985, you published them, and I have it in front of me. Opinions of the Office of Legal Counsel. The previous opinion. Barr retreated. It has been the long-established policy of OLC that, except in very exceptional circumstances, the opinions must remain confidential, Barr replied. The reference to very exceptional circumstances backtracked from what Barr had just said and what the letter sent to Representative Edwards by the Assistant Attorney General had claimed. But even the assertion that OLC opinions were released only in very exceptional circumstances could not withstand scrutiny. The Justice Department had shared OLC opinions with Congress on many occasions during the 1980s, as a letter by Representative Edwards to the Justice Department later detailed. Barr then pointed out his willingness to provide Congress with, quote, our conclusions and our reasoning, unquote. This was the 13-page written testimony which contained a detailed recounting of the views expressed in the OLC opinion. Chairman Edwards complained that Barr had violated the rules of the House by submitting his written testimony only that same morning of the hearing rather than 48 hours in advance. Barr's timing meant that members of the committee and their staff were not well equipped to analyze or question the OLC's analysis. But at least they had the OLC's views in writing. Or did they? I mean, it actually says that in the thing. Or did they? After, and if, after a phrase like that, it always pays to have the music all queued up and ready to go. So did they? Barr's description of the OLC's views included that as a matter of domestic law, the president has the authority to authorize actions by the FBI in foreign countries in violation of customary international law. Now, without the benefit of the OLC opinion, Professor Coe explained how Barr could be hiding important matters by asking Congress and the public to just trust the 13-page version. Coe wrote, Barr's continuing refusal to release the 1989 opinion left outsiders with no way to tell whether it rested on factual assumptions that did not apply to the earlier situation, which part of the earlier opinion had not been overruled, or whether the overruling opinion contained 
nuances, subtleties, or exceptions that Barr's summary and testimony simply omitted. Well, Coe's words proved prescient. The next section is entitled, What Barr Left Out of His Report to Congress. I am not the first to notice that Barr's testimony omitted parts of the OLC opinion that would have earned the Justice Department scorn from the halls of Congress, legal experts, and the public. Over one and a half years after his testimony, Congress finally subpoenaed Barr's 1989 opinion. Another House Judiciary Subcommittee issued the subpoena on July 25, 1991. The administration first resisted, and mind you, this is a year and a half later, a year and a half before they decided to check on whether or not he was just BSing his way through this thing, because that wasn't done. But I'm sure at that point they've said, we've got to build the case that it might have been done here so that we can finally subpoena this thing. So a year and a half later, July 25th, 1991, they subpoena it. The administration first resisted, more time wasting, but within a week, and that's pretty fast actually, agreed that members of Congress could see the full opinion. That same month, the Washington Post's Michael Isikoff obtained a copy of the OLC opinion. The Clinton administration within its first year in office, then published the OLC opinion in 1993, making it publicly available for the first time. Uh-oh, that means we get to take a look and find out whether or not Barr was full of it in 1988. I don't think he was anticipating that. Or maybe he didn't care because he was already out of office. Isakoff was drawn to a major issue that Barr had not disclosed in his testimony. The 1989 opinion asserted that the president could violate the United Nations Charter, because such actions are, quote, fundamentally political questions, i.e., what are you going to do about it? You can only vote me out, uh, or I guess, I don't know if he brought up the subject, impeach me, but uh, that there's nothing you can do about it, essentially. That proposition is very a very difficult one to sustain, as Brian Finucane, I'm guessing at his pronunciation, and Marty Lederman, whose name is easy enough, have explained, Barr was wrong. The 1989 opinion ignored the president's constitutional duty to take care that U.S. laws, including ratified treaties, be faithfully executed. And guess what the U.N. Charter is, right? And the opinion conflated the so-called political question doctrine which is really about whether courts can review an executive branch action with the question of whether an executive branch action is authorized or legal. What's more important for our purposes is not whether the 1989 opinion was wrong on the central point, but the fact that Barr failed to disclose this principal conclusion to Congress. Although, quite honestly, I could spend quite a bit of time on the really rather obvious and glaring error of confusing what the political question doctrine actually is. I mean, they've invented a, a brand new and wrong definition of it. Well, we don't have to... Uh, <clears throat> the president is authorized to send the FBI into a foreign country and abduct its leader <clears throat> using the FBI because doing so falls under the political question doctrine. It's a fundamentally political question. No, it's it's a matter of international law. But I guess, I mean, in your in, in Barr's imagining, uh, who would enforce international law? Nobody. It can't be enforced. Well, you know, there's a whole body that actually would enforce international law if you could if they could get their hands on you. It's pretty ineffectual because, well, ironically, <clears throat> it depends on being able to snatch up a foreign leader and bring him to justice before the International Court of Justice in The Hague, I guess, or wherever they might choose to sit. But, uh, yeah, I guess that's kind of difficult to do in most cases. But uh, anyway, I, I mean, the, the fact that it's difficult to drag somebody before the International Court of Justice and that would mean that Americans only political only only recourse against the president who violates the UN charter would be to vote him out of office. Uh, that doesn't mean that questions of whether or not enforcing the UN charter are political questions that courts can't reach. But 
I don't know. I mean, I guess you could, uh, I guess, in, in a realistic, I guess a, a legal realist sense, maybe there is. Maybe Armando would even agree. It's it's um, frowned upon to stretch a legal doctrine with an established definition to that extent. But, um, you know, maybe it's warranted given that there are almost no actors in the world who would be willing to execute any sort of international warrant for the president of the United States to abscond with him bodily to the International Court of Justice uh, to stand trial for violating the UN Charter, especially under circumstances like this, in which really, honestly, everybody, probably everybody kind of wanted Manuel Noriega gone. It wasn't worth whatever the consequences might have been of kidnapping the president of the United States and hauling him before the International Court of Justice. I just, and, and, and it's pretty rare that circumstances like that would surface. Uh, typically, presidents of the United States will do anything they can not to put themselves in a position whereby the rest of the world would give its at least tacit agreement to standing by and watching the president of the United States hauled before the International Court of Justice. I don't know if that's still the case right now, but that's a good reason to cultivate close relations with nuclear power and um, mobocracy in Russia. Uh, presumably they too would stand in the way of uh, seeing the United States president kidnapped and brought before the International Court of Justice. And as between the two of them, there are two security UN Security Council vetoes wrapped up in all of that. And uh, a third vote depends apparently on a constant supply of the most beautiful chocolate cake from Mar-a-Lago, China, could also uh, vote the same way. And of course, uh, Theresa May and the Brexiteers Nigel Farage would add another vote. And um, boy, does, it's interesting how much he loves old Europe sometimes when it comes to cultivating relations with those crazy French who don't even know how to put out a fire. But boy, do they know how to put on a parade. I get along so well with Emmanuel Macron. And when he comes here to the United States, we tour Mount Vernon together and talk about how it should have been gold plated and named for Trump. It's just weird that he has such an interesting relationship with uh, the rest of the UN Security Council. But still, the rest of the world, not that pleased, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, I mean, from a legal realist perspective, it may be the case that uh, um, it is a political question in that nobody in the world will enforce the UN Charter against the United States. So the ultimate recourse it belongs to the the body politic of America. Well, that's depressing. Anyway, back to the story. There was a reason Isakov considered the conclusion about the UN Charter newsworthy. That's because it had not been known before. The leading analysis of the Barr opinion is in a forthcoming article in Cornell Law Review by Finucane. I'm guessing at how he's... I, Brian, poor Brian here. F-I-N-U-C-A-N-E. Finucane, Maybe. Uh, well, Cornell Law Review will have the news anyway. He observes, The members of the subcommittee appear to have been unaware of the opinion's treatment of the UN Charter, and the witness did not volunteer this information during the hearing. And I probably wouldn't either. It would be very scary to be that far out on a limb, but that's just me, and uh, I probably would have coughed it up, I guess, in a hearing, but I wouldn't be uh, directing the OLC in the first place, most likely. Too much pressure for me, plus I'm not that good. Professor Gene Woods, in a 1996 Law Review article in Boston University International Law Journal, I have to catch my breath just from the title there, also observed the large discrepancy between Barr's 13-page testimony and what it failed to disclose. Barr's congressional testimony attempted to gloss over the broad legal and policy changes that his written opinion advocated. Careful analysis of the published opinion and the reasoning underlying it, however, reveals the depth of its deviation from accepted norms, Professor Woods wrote. Now, omission number two. 
the presumption that acts of Congress comply with international law. Woods also noted that the OLC opinion failed to properly apply the so-called Charming Betsy method for interpreting statutes. Wow. What might that be? Hang on. You'll find out. The canon of statutory construction, this Charming, charming Betsy method, comes from an 1804 decision. And uh, whenever you have a, something that, with a weird name like that, you can bet that it comes from an early decision. The decision being, of course, Murray versus the schooner, the ship, the schooner ship Charming Betsy. Now, that's not a bad name for a ship. It's just a bad name for a legal doctrine. But that's just, uh, it, came, it comes from the fact that the case that enunciated it was called Murray versus the schooner Charming Betsy. How do you get in a lawsuit versus a boat? I don't know. But, uh, well, I mean, I could tell you, I give you an example. We'll see if this one actually outlines it or not. But, you know, lawsuits are weird. Uh, but in that case, the Supreme Court stated, however they got to it, an act of Congress ought never to be construed to violate the law of nations if any other possible construction remains. That's what we call a canon of statutory construction. How should courts uh, interpret statutes if there's any ambiguity. And what they're saying here is it, you should never construe a statute to violate the law of nations if there's any other way you could possibly read this thing. In other words, Congress should be presumed to authorize only actions that are consistent with U.S. obligations under international law. As Professor Curtis Bradley has written since 1804, this canon of construction has become an important component of the legal regime defining the U.S. relationship with international law. It is applied regularly by the Supreme Court and lower federal courts, and it is enshrined in the black letter law provisions of the influential restatement of the foreign relations law of the United States. In other words, it has always been the case, certainly since 1804 and probably before, that Courts, in interpreting the meaning of federal statutes, will presume that the intent was to make its make the to to interpret this law as consistent with America's obligations to honor international law at every possible turn. Barr's opinion not only failed to apply the charming Betsy presumption in favor of international law. The opinion applied what might be called a reverse charming Betsy. Barr had reasoned that in the absence of an explicit restriction concerning international law, the congressional statute should be read to authorize the executive branch to violate international law. That seems backwards and upside down, doesn't it? And it is. Because as part of his law enforcement powers, the president has the inherent authority, inherent authority, to override customary international law, what? That's what he says. It must be presumed that Congress intended to grant the president's instrumentality the authority to act in contravention of international law when directed to do so, the opinion stated. That part of the OLC's analysis has not withstood the test of time. Indeed, there was good reason to keep it buried. And finally, a third thing, a third omission, Barr's testimony failed to inform Congress that the 1989 opinion discussed international law at all, I guess. Barr's written testimony said that the opinion, quote, is strictly a legal analysis of the FBI's authority as a matter of domestic law to conduct extraterritorial arrests of individuals for violations of U.S. law. During the hearing, he added that the opinion did not address how specific treaties would apply in a given context. The State Department's legal advisor, who appeared alongside Barr, supported this characterization of the opinion by saying, The Office of Legal Counsel, as the office within the Department of Justice responsible for articulating the executive branch view of domestic law, 
recently issued an opinion concerning the FBI's domestic legal authority to conduct arrests abroad without host country consent. Mr. Barr has summarized its conclusions for you. As Mr. Barr has indicated, that opinion addressed a narrow question, the domestic legal authority to make such arrests. My role today is to address issues not discussed in the OLC opinion, the international law and foreign policy implications of a non-consensual arrest in a foreign country. But the OLC opinion had addressed some questions of international law and how a specific treaty, the UN Charter, might apply in such contexts. The 1980 opinion, which the 1989 one reversed, included strong statements about the international legal prohibition on abductions in other countries without the state's consent. In analyzing Article 2.4 of the UN Charter, the 1980 opinion quoted from a famous United Nations Security Council resolution which condemned the abduction of Adolf Eichmann in Argentina by Israeli forces. The 1980 OLC opinion stated, Commentators have construed this action to be a definitive construction of the United Nations Charter as proscribing forcible abduction in the absence of acquiescence by the asylum state. That's a pretty strong statement given that pretty much everybody knew that Adolf Eichmann needed to face justice. But ultimately, uh, the process people won out, at least on paper. I mean, well, ultimately, Israel won out in reality. They captured Adolf Eichmann, uh, brought him to Israel to face charges, uh, convicted and executed him. But on paper, everybody said, well, you really shouldn't be allowed, per se, to abduct someone from another country. Okay, duly noted. But political and legal realists will point out Adolf Eichmann is still dead. The OLC's 1989 opinion, though, took a very different view. It stated the text of Article 2.4 does not prohibit extraterritorial law enforcement activities, and we question whether Article 2.4 should be construed as generally addressing these activities. I guess in a matter of in a manner of speaking, I guess you could that too could be legal realism. Eichmann's gone, he's dead, they took him, so it really doesn't prohibit extraterritorial law enforcement activities. Well, I don't know. Everybody said that it did, but they didn't invade Israel and take him back, so maybe that's it. The opinion also engaged in what many legal experts would consider controversial, if not clearly wrong, claims about international law. As one example, the 1989 opinion stated, quote, because sovereignty over territory derives not from the possession of legal title, but from the reality of effective control. Hmm, this is politically realistic, isn't it? Because sovereignty over territory does not derive from the possession of legal title, that is on paper, but from the reality of effective control, that is realism, logic would suggest that there would be no violation of international law in exercising law enforcement activity in foreign territory over which no state exercises effective control. It's actually inapposite here, unless you're saying, well, we can kick the crap out of Panama with the United States Armed Forces. So is there really a Panama is the underlying assumption here. Do they really have sovereignty in Panama, considering the fact that we could take it away from them uh, in a moment, at a, you know, at any given time? The fact that the opinion had to resort to such a claim of, quote, logic rather than jurisprudence or the practice and legal views of states indicated its shallowness. I mean, this is very fancy terminology for um, the logic that underlies this is might makes right. Can we kick the crap out of this country? Then it's not a country. They don't have sovereignty over their territory if we can go in there and kidnap them and take them away. Now, I guess the larger question is, could Israel have taken Argentina at that point? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't matter because it's an entirely gimmitarian uh, question for Barr. We can do this. We did do this. It may be the case that Israel did do it. Um, I don't know whether Israel cared about what our logic was at the time, but who cares? Because right now that's our logic and we need it for Panama 
It's not their logic, and they didn't need it for Eichmann, and who cares, essentially. In fairness to Barr, can you believe that? In fairness to Barr, these statements of international law were not the principal conclusions of the opinion, and once again, it is not so relevant to our purposes uh, whether these statements of law were wrong. What's relevant is that Barr represented to Congress in his written and oral testimony that the OLC opinion did not address these legal issues, even though it did. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGRO in the Morning, with a brand new, brand new interruption to say thanks to all of you who support the show. Remember when I told you that our average monthly donation was about $7, for which you were getting two great hours of news and entertainment five days a week, and how that came out to about 70 cents an hour? That's a pretty good deal, except it's wrong. The math actually works out closer to 17 cents an hour. It is hard to beat a deal like that, and even harder to send your kids to college on. Thankfully, Patreon.com makes it easy to make that work. Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, is the simple, secure way to make recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Just search for me or the show name on the site, and they make it easy to crowdfund the show so that the power of our numbers can keep the show going for just a few bucks a month. Once again, thanks so much for all your support. Welcome back now to the Kegger in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We're actually about 10 seconds from the exciting conclusion of the article, though we really reached it at this point, but there are a few more words. We might as well read them out. In the final analysis, Barr's efforts in 1989 did not serve the Justice Department well. He had long left government service when the OLC opinion was finally made public. The true content of the opinion, given what Barr told the American people and testified before Congress, remains much to the discredit of the now attorney general. That is a strong conclusion. It's true, but uh, almost uh, um, uh, anticlimax to all of us. And in fact, the whole thing is sort of anticlimactic because the <clears throat> the really exciting and uh, um, I was going to say, you know, earth shaking, but uh, it's almost too positive. Uh, the, the turning upside down of everything over, I guess, what amounts to like the ultimate in legal and political realism, might makes right as the basis for this memo. Well, I mean, I guess if I had known that I had based a memo, uh, a gimmitarian memo like this on might makes right, we, we can do it because no one can stop us. And that should be a legal basis upon which nation states are allowed to act, but everyone who knows us and knows me would know that I would never approve of such a legal opinion being adopted as a motivating uh, influence for any other country in the world, least of all Russia or the then Soviet Union. Um, I, I, I guess I can understand why he didn't tell them that that was the case and hid it from them and did all he could to keep it hidden until he had left office. But, uh, wow. I mean, like I said, it's almost anticlimactic that this ends up being about, well, remember, the article is uh, intended to prove that William Barr is not to be trusted when he says that he will summarize the principal conclusions of a lengthy document for us or for the country, for Congress specifically. And the proof is he has been in position, been in a position where he has promised to do that before and has failed to do it. The proof that he failed to do it is the following. He hid the actual substance of the 1989 memo uh, in a, um, a, a false summary that he submitted to Congress. And we know that the uh, real content of the memo now since published is not only different from what he put in the summary, but astonishing and worrisome in its own right, undermining the international world order. But then again, that's exactly what uh, Trump fans who align themselves with the pseudo-intellectual stylings, I guess, of Steve Bannon are 
most excited to claim is at the heart of their Trump support. I want to tear down the international order, the globalists international order. Um, although it just doesn't make any sense because, you know, various reasons. But anyway, uh, uh, there you go. There, uh, because logic. There, uh, I've written an OLC memo, and you can't find out until I'm out of office. I guess that's important uh, and leads to a number of uh, connected thoughts, including one that uh, I wasn't really expecting to get to today. But maybe you saw at some point yesterday, who tweeted this out? I don't think I have to scroll all that far back in order to find it. But... uh, yeah, where was this one? Yeah, I think yesterday morning I thought I had seen this one. Ah, yeah, here it is. Uh, oh, look, it's Jed Sugarman, of all people, who had tweeted this out. Jed Sugarman, of course, from Fordham Law, whose name came up in, was it in this very article or was it in one of the uh, previous ones? Uh, I I can't even... Was that the one about whether William Barr should recuse himself on the Mueller report? It's all connected, I tell you. So Jed Sugarman was tweeting yesterday that uh, um, he said uh, this. So maybe you're wondering if a cabinet member has ever been impeached. I don't know exactly why people would be wondering this, but it might be because all of the Trump cabinet are corrupt bastards and, and should be impeached. Maybe you're wondering if a cabinet member has ever been impeached. Here's a short history of impeaching department heads. And the very first one offered up here is William Belknap. Now, uh, listeners, longtime listeners of the show with extraordinary memories will, of course, immediately perk up at the mention of William Belknap, Secretary of War during the Grant administration, impeached for kickback corruption, Uh, Sugarman notes here, majority of the Senate, but not two thirds voted to convict in 1876. He resigned anyway. And I, of course, felt compelled to point out, as I have here on the show, that there's a great fun fact about Belknap and his impeachment. He was impeached after he resigned. So yes, that can happen. You can, in fact, impeach officials no longer in office. He was, uh, given a warning in no uncertain terms that impeachment was imminent. He resigned, I assume, hoping to moot the whole point, but the Congress actually went ahead with it anyway. The House voted on the question of whether or not they could impeach him despite the fact that he was no longer in office, and they decided that because the penalties prescribed by the Constitution for impeachment included barring people from further government service and not simply and only the removal from office. That clearly contemplated that uh, there was more important uh, work to be done, at least possibly, by an impeachment trial than simply removing the person for office. That being the case, it must be within their power to do so. They went ahead and did so. The Senate separately, as I recall from the historical record of the impeachment considered the question of whether or not it could hold a trial given that he had already resigned from office it too decided that a trial would be proper however uh, failed to convict him only garnering a majority for conviction rather than the necessary two-thirds um, I'm, I'm curious about whether the rest of Sugarman's tweet thread is likewise of interest because I see the next one is illustrated with a photo of Matthew Whitaker. I'm just curious to see what this one says here. The second entry in his tweet storm after the one about William Belknap is Attorney General Harry Dougherty was threatened with impeachment in 1922 for his DOJ's bootlegger kickback scandal. He was not impeached, but the investigation led to his resignation I discussed this in a Washington Post op-ed on Whitaker this year under the title of uh, uh, Think Matthew Whitaker is a Hack? He's one of many. To fix things, the Justice Department must be allowed to act more independently of the president. His third tweet was about Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon, the famously wealthy tycoon, uh, and has supported the the disastrous politics. Oh, I guess that 
the statement about him at the time was that he has supported the disastrous policies of trickle down and fiscal austerity and was blamed for meddling with the Fed to keep rates too low. And that's uh, followed by some exclamation points and parentheses and contributing to and exacerbating the Great Depression of 1929. Then there was 1932, Texas Representative Wright Patman began impeachment processes against Mellon. Wright Patman, by the way, the uh, namesake of the Capitol Hill Federal Credit Union, serving members and staff on Capitol Hill. Just side note. Anyway, uh, he began impeachment process against Mellon, alleging violations of conflicts of interest conflicts of interest laws. To avoid impeachment, President Hoover removed Mellon from Treasury and made him ambassador to the UK. And oh, look, look at that! And yes, that's the same Wright Patman from Watergate. I remember him more from the. Uh, like I said, being the namesake of the uh, Federal Credit Union. But okay, Watergate. Does anybody remember him from that? Hmm. Well, that's uh, quite a ways to be, uh, quite a ways uh, a length of service here. Yes, it's the same Wright Patman 40 years later from uh, Leon, uh, what are we looking at? Neon Nefak. Uh and his outstanding podcast, Slow Burn, if you happen to be a listener. Episode 2, The Defeat of Wright Patman. How Nixon Blocked the First Congressional Investigation into Watergate. Uh, number 6 here, George W. Bush's AG Alberto Gonzalez faced impeachment, remember this, for his role in firing U.S. attorneys for not advancing partisan Republican agenda, for torture, which of course they called enhanced interrogation, and warrantless surveillance. See below, must read on Comey, Mueller, and Jack Goldsmith. Probably a good idea to get that background if you're not familiar. And um, yeah, I mean, I was, you know, wrapped up in that too. And uh, that's how I came out of, or I guess that's how I came into the current uh, setting with less than glowing respect for Comey in particular, um, Mueller in part. Uh, and Jack Goldsmith every time we read him, and even when he's making fantastic legal points, um, but between him and, and uh, um, well, everybody who was involved in the George W. Bush administration, and uh, I don't know, they, they, they didn't necessarily cover themselves in glory back in those days either. All right, uh, number seven in the tweet stream here. In 2007, Jay Inslee called for impeachment hearings by House Judiciary against Gonzalez. There were no hearings, but Gonzalez resigned about two months later. Gonzalez was one of many examples of the crony AG, as uh, he wrote in, I guess, uh, an article in Fordham Law Review, which is connect uh, linked herein. And I think that's the end of his tweet stream, but... All very interesting, and I just thought it was uh, important, but I guess not that many people agreed, that uh, we mention the fact that Belknap was impeached after leaving office. And that's important for a lot of people, including all the people who uh, somehow skated unscathed through the George W. Bush administration, who we should have taken care of back in the days when we were advocating looking backward but Barack Obama was not. But what do I know? The swing voters of Ohio want Barack Obama back, and I take him as an improvement on the current situation, of course, but I'm not so sure I'd be very, very happy about it. Anyway, I think that covers things for William Barr today. I think we did a remarkable job in, uh, what shall we say, curating the articles that are out there. That one was very interesting. And I, you can see why I decided to spend that much more time on the Just Security article. I, we, you got the basics from the rundown uh, that Mark Sumner gave you. And front page stuff, you know, we want to keep it brisk and snappy. But uh, here, on, uh, here on Daily Coast Radio, we're willing to drag it out forever to get to the bottom, uh, the very, very bottom, the, the uh, uh, Mariana's Trench of, uh, I guess, are they, are there, there's no weeds down at the bottom of the trench, I presume. But if they are, they uh, they don't need any light and they can withstand enormous amounts of pressure. And I don't know, somehow that's a fitting metaphor. No, moving on, because it really doesn't fit anything. The Washington Post has another interesting story that we'll throw in there and I bet there'll be some weird connections. 
because the topics are all related. This was a great idea for an article. Spencer Sue has put this one together. The foreman of the Watergate Grand Jury, the foreman of Watergate Grand Jury number one, in fact, has been watching the confrontations with another president. Uh, that gentleman now 91 years of age, by the way, Matrix glitch, his first name, Vladimir, second, his last name here, uh, there's no chance that I'm going to get the pronunciation right, P-R-E-G-E-L-J. Now, those of you who were um, adult consumers of news during Watergate probably remember the pronunciation, but I was six, so probably not. Vladimir, uh, let's say, Preglage, I'm going to uh, or Pregelj, Pregelj. I have no idea how that's pronounced, and I, I it's one of the few times I wishes I, that I was uh, older or was more aware of uh, politics and the nightly news back in the days when I would probably have preferred watching the Flintstones. Anyway, like millions of Americans, our grand jury foreman here, who I won't insult with bad pronunciation, has waited to learn more about the special counsel's report, but. As few others can, the foreman of Watergate Grand Jury Number 1 understands the burden of working in secret for years on a high-profile investigation involving a president. At 91, he still lives in the Capitol Hill townhouse he resided in 45 years ago when he commuted to court to hear evidence in a special prosecutor's investigation of Richard M. Nixon and the cover-up of his campaign's break-in at the Democratic National Committee headquarters. That's Watergate, by the way, in case... Some of you didn't realize that uh, there's really there really are people that run into who are politically aware, uh, but who, like me, were too young at the time um, to uh, come to the uh, realization that Watergate wasn't just another gate suffix. It was the first gate suffix from which we stole all the rest of the gate suffixes. That was a, a hotel and residential complex wherein the Democratic National Committee maintained a headquarters at the time. But now, I mean, I think we all know that now, but you never know. Anyway, uh, let's see. We're going to try one more time at this uh, pronunciation. Preg, preg, elj, preg, elj, P-R-E-G-E-L-J. Anyone with an idea on that one? Uh, let me know. I think we'll try and monitor the, the Twitter feed to see if we get a, a hand on that one. Anyway, uh, Pregelj, a retired Library of Congress researcher, is tight-lipped about President Trump, but of the work behind closed doors by Special Counsel Robert S. Mueller III, just to make the name even longer, he said, In my citizen's heart, I feel the information gathered by the grand jury should be made public, which is, of course, what ended up happening with a lot of the information that the grand jury gathered back in the Watergate days. Pregelj says, stands behind a letter he wrote to Nixon on behalf of the grand jury summoning, futilely, a president to testify in person before his fellow citizens. If we have to find out what happened, if anyone was involved that should have come out as far as Nixon was concerned, Pregelj said, as for Trump, he said with a smile, I'm not on this grand jury. Hmm. Uh, under threat of impeachment proceedings, Nixon, of course, resigned in August of 1974. I was, in a sense, disappointed because I thought, with all the evidence that we had, there was enough cause for indicting Nixon. It was, in a sense, a disappointment that justice didn't run its course, he said. Mueller's office submitted its report on March 22nd to Attorney General William P. Barr, marking the end of the investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election and the beginning of the watch to see what is released to the public. While Mueller has finished, several related cases were transferred to the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office, uh -oh. and its prosecutors say that the work of the 23-member grand jury impaneled on July 6, 2017, and whose term is not set to expire until July 5th, quote, continues robustly. And uh, I would very much like to see that grand jury take the lesson of the Watergate grand jury number one and make a report directly to Congress, much like the one we read about in the so-called roadmap stories 
in the last couple of weeks. From his home filled with early modernist sketches and books. Ah, a pronunciation guide. Uh, the Parenthetically, now at the bottom, they finally tell us how to pronounce this. It's pronounced Pregel. P-R-E-G-E-L-J. Pregel. Okay, there's no J sound at all from the J. Very difficult to understand unless I, you are familiar, I guess, with uh, Eastern European languages. And I'm not, really. So, from his home filled with early modernist sketches and books, Pregel, thanks very much, recalled that his grand jury of 23 met more than 100 times its first 18 months of a full year, full two-year run with two jurors losing their jobs as a result. Yeah. Another member, a night shift custodian at George Washington University, quit the panel, she later told a reporter, because it was too hard to be on the jury by day and the job at night and care for her 11 children. I can absolutely sympathize. Wow. Pregel remembered the stylish colleague the press nicknamed the Chic Lady, who came up with things that probably should have been explored further and the strange experience of questioning senior presidential aides about obstructing justice and perjury, an unusual way of rubbing elbows with people in the headlines. Must have been exciting. Most of all, he recalled, the psychological pressure and moral burden of knowing so much and being obliged to say so little to fulfill the grand jury's civic duty. We are all affected by that obligation, Pregol said. He's a very secretive person, said his wife, Leah Plut Pregel, 72, an education researcher. Married in 1980, she said it wasn't until four years later that Pregel talked about his time on the Watergate panel, and then not in detail. News accounts of the time described the tall, thick-haired international trade specialist as a good-looking intellectual nicknamed Miro by his co-workers. Okay, uh, whatever. Uh, very interesting. It's, uh, so there you go, a little bit of a taste of the 1970s uh, conventional wisdom. He, they'll say he looks like a good-looking intellectual. So it wasn't always just the women described uh, in terms of their looks, but I think uh, you'll find that probably by comparison... The things they said about women in the early 1970s were considerably worse. And uh, while things may have improved for men, they've only <laughs> improved for the women. But there you go. There was still the chic lady. Anyway, I guess uh, you could say uh, people were universally disrespected in those days. Although federal criminal rules strictly bar grand jurors from being named, Pregel was identified in July of 1973 after John J. Sirica, remember him, then the chief judge of the U.S. District Court in Washington, assembled the panel in open court and polled them to establish that they supported ordering the White House to explain Nixon's refusal to turn over Oval Office tape recordings. This grand jury really took itself very, very seriously. And I wish that their example were illustrated more clearly to the current grand jury. Maybe it has been, and they just declined to be quite so strident. Seven months later, on March 1st, 1974, the grand jury indicted seven top Nixon aides, including his campaign chairman and former U.S. Attorney General John Mitchell. Letters poured into Pregel that he has kept, and there are some photos of these handwritten and uh, at least one other typed letter. Very interesting. Uh, uh, by way of illustration, a Wichita woman wrote to the, quote, grand jury foreman, uh, and I guess she didn't know the name then, and said uh, that she and many others were frustrated, all these lawyers out to get Nixon, uh, adding, you all ought to be tarred and feathered. How nice. She continued, why don't you stop this terrible thing? It is ruining our country, both home and abroad. That's what it says. Try digging up the dirt and mistakes of former presidents. None are perfect. What great logic. But after Nixon was pardoned by his successor, Gerald Ford, on September 8th, 1974, a woman from Cary, North Carolina, wrote to Prego three days later saying, This can't happen to our country. I urge you to inform the public of the facts 
if no one else will, adding that she was sick with outrage at the pardoning of Nixon and the potential pardons of all Watergate defendants. And I get used to it. The, visit, the visibility of Pragel and his colleagues after their appearance in open court and the self-disclosure of the forewoman of the grand jury that investigated President Bill Clinton's dealings with Monica Lewinsky contrast with the continuing anonymity of Grand Jury 17-1, the Mueller Grand Jurors. It was impaneled at the E. Barrett Prettyman Federal Courthouse on Constitution Avenue Northwest seven weeks after Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein authorized Mueller to investigate any links and or coordination between Trump's campaign and Russian government interference in the 2016 U.S. election. For safety and security reasons, court officials encouraged the jurors early on to enter the courthouse through the side door not used by the public. Unlike the foreman and deputy of three other grand juries working at the courthouse, the two leaders of the Mueller panel have not been identified handing up indictments in open court. Rob Goldstone, this guy again, the British music promoter who said he testified to the panel about setting up the June 2016 meeting at Trump Tower, between Veselnitskaya and uh, senior Trump campaign officials, said jurors were a great cross-section of people. I would say of the 22 or 23 that day, half of them at least looked uninterested. A few looked really interested. Goldstone said in a Washington Post interview in September, they had to go back another week, another week, and they're still going back and listening. I don't know how they stay focused on it. Pragel said his grand jury interacted little with Sirica or the special prosecutor, but grew close to the assistant prosecutors who worked with them day after day after they were convened June 5th, 1972. After three weeks of hearing routine street and violent crimes, they got the case of the June 17th Watergate burglary. When one burglar, James W. McCord Jr., a former CIA officer providing security for the Nixon campaign, began cooperating, it unraveled a scheme that occupied three grand juries over more than two years. Pragel's was the first and busiest. Archibald Cox, the initial special prosecutor for Watergate, wrote later in a book that its members were truly a cross-section of the people of Washington, made up of 13 women and 10 men and six white and 17 African-American jurors. They ranged from their late 20s to 60s. A few were single, but most were married with children. Almost half worked for the government, and others were unemployed or retired, with only one or two, but no more, educated for a profession, Cox wrote. Regular government employees stayed on salary, but the rest of the time received $20 a day and 10 cents a mile for travel. It was simply said, you will be the foreman, Prego recalled of the court's designation. A Slovenian-born son of a college professor, Pragel spent four years as a refugee after World War II. He won a scholarship to St. Joseph's College in Rensselaer, Indiana, served in the U.S. Army, became a citizen, and earned a master's degree at Fordham University, again, in the Bronx, before joining the Library of Congress in 1957. Behind the scenes, Watergate prosecutors in the court confronted murky questions that resonate to this day, which, of course, is not news to any of you. Uh, and not that the questions have gotten any clearer in the time since, except for the fact that uh, it seems like essentially Republicans seem intent on committing the same crimes, only a little more obviously, on cycles of about every 15 years, which is a long-running theme in my own writing and discussion here on the show. We don't have time to finish up with this article but I think I've given you an interesting taste of it. I'll, of course, include it in the summary of today's uh, show. You can read the rest for yourself. It looks very interesting. And uh, timely publication and a great idea by Spencer Sue, I think. Um, hopefully, he's interested in uh, sort of quietly getting to the current grand jurors the story of the assertiveness of this grand jury and how seriously they took their power and sway. And uh, there's a lot that a grand jury can do. They are actually uh, empowered with some extraordinary and sweeping powers, to use the same word twice in the sentence. Um, And uh, if they insist 
on making certain facts available to Congress. They may, in fact, be able to circumvent the power play that Bill Barr is running here, trying to prevent their own developed material from getting into the hands of Congress so that they can know the full story behind the Mueller investigation. And Mueller should by now be familiar with that, and it may just be that he's so by the book that uh, he won't suggest this course of action to them, but wouldn't object if they found out about it on their own. So hopefully uh, they're reading the papers. Anyway, time now to hand the microphone over to Justice Putnam for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I probably should have been telling you about what's coming up next, but I can assure you it's fantastic stuff. Look at this. Uh, It's all about bar in the beginning. We'll be covering that as well as some other surprising stories I'll tell you about after this. Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the Kegro in the Morning Show with David Waltman. All right, so coming up, a majority of Republicans, believe it or not, think white evangelical Christians are more discriminated against than women, the elderly, the disabled, Muslims, black, Latinx, and LBGQ. I've got the numbers, the letters backwards on that. Uh, more, and then more again from the international front, all the esoterica coming up next.